being recorded. Meetings being recorded and pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so um, by logging in um, through the Board of Health website. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Board of Health website an audio recording and the minutes of the proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. The meeting will open and with a roll call. So Lauren, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Tim? Here. Steve? Here. Maureen? Here. Nancy here, and we're joined by Jen Brown and Ed Smith. So the first uh, uh, item is to review the minutes of the November 18th meeting. And I had two comments. One is on this, is the, and I don't know where to put it, the second to the last paragraph under the um, uh, refuse uh, collection and mandatory recycling that it was pointed out that Amherst residents can already choose to have biweekly curbside pickup and, and recycling of organics. Um, but it was noted that it is not um, uh, advertised by the USA a company, so people have to know about it. It's not well advertised. That was brought up. I don't know how to put it in there. I get that. I get that. that was true. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll fix that. And then the other one is under the Board of Health statement on racism. So it was Health Director Jen Brown and Nancy Gilbert um, will meet next week with members of the UMass. It was both Jen and I were meeting. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. That was all I saw, minor things. Anybody else? I, I did see a few typos, but I don't think, I don't know if we're supposed to comment on those. Yeah, tell Steve if you see a typo. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Lauren, oh, we can I'd have it. to find, sorry, I'd have to find it again because I don't have it open right on my computer. So if you just give me a minute, but I could just let, I could just email it as well, not to hold, you know. Okay. Hold but I think it was, um, it was at the end. Okay. But, I do it soon, Lauren, because I usually like to get these out, you know, like the next day, just so I get a uh, deal with them. So let me know as soon as you can and I'll fix it. Okay, may I have a motion to accept the minutes? I'll move to accept the minutes. Second. Or second it. <laughs> second, I'll second it. All in favor, Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Lauren? <laughs> Lauren, do Aye. you? And Nancy, I. Okay. Next. I said on, I. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, is good too. <laughs> yes. Um, next on the agenda is the recombinant DNA regulation, the update um, from Steve and Maureen. And Steve sent out the. Uh, how would you describe it? <laughs> a, just a, a okay. with like, change with, with what we want to change, possible yeah, change. Yeah, well, it, it's a list of sort of possible proposed changes, although, you know, right. we're still trying to work out exactly what we should be doing here. It's not, it's not simple. I mean, I think a case could be made that if we didn't have these regulations, we wouldn't be putting them in now um, because, you know, there's, the situation has really changed quite a bit since they were put in. On the other hand, uh, 
there's a reason. You know, there, the risk is not zero. And so, uh, you know, I guess if we take them away completely, it kind of suggests that we don't care about it. And so I, I suppose we're going to keep them in some form. But then the issue is that really there's only one institution now that's affected, and that's Amherst College. And Amherst does uh, some work at what's called BSL-2. So, you know, there are these four levels. And BSL-2 is a case where there are pathogens or, you know, there's the potential for disease, but it's low. You know, there, if, if a lab worker were to get exposed, they might get, it might have some slight problem, but it's not life-threatening or anything like that. That's the highest level that is now being performed at any institution that we have control over in Amherst. But then you could say, well, what if a company, you know, what if a pharmaceutical company wanted to start up here? I think that would be very welcome by the town, for, you know, let's say a research branch of a pharmaceutical company. And in that case, they might well be doing something at level three, which is uh, that those are, those are pathogens that could cause a serious illness but there is some treatment for it. Uh, and so if that were the case, we would wanna make sure that that organization was conforming to the, the national guidelines. So I guess you can make the argument that we need it for that reason. And if so, there are still are some changes that we were thinking of putting in, which are in this list. And we're not gonna vote on them today, but I just thought before going to all the work of really redrafting the entire thing and including all the definitions, we would just give everybody a chance to look at it and either make comments now or sometime in the next couple of weeks. And then if then we would incorporate that or consider that in trying to draft the complete set of revised guidelines. My concerns have been if we have these regulations, we should be following them. You know, I think we have, I don't know what's happened and I don't know that there have been the inspections and um, the uh, requirements to get minutes from the, the biosafety committees at the colleges. Um, so I think it's probably worse to have a regulation that's not being followed. And then also, I mean, if we, you know, we, as Steve and I talked about, well, what maybe we shouldn't require inspections or reporting, yeah. but if we're not doing that, we don't know anything either. So. Um, I guess it, it's kind of a balance is do we, tr I feel like the colleges are generally trust for the, we're the agents with their, that are risk averse, um, but should we be making sure that they are following these federal guidelines in addition to that and, and just being aware of what's happening um, on the campuses. Um, you know, if there was a fire in a lab or if there was, I don't, I, I, I think it, it's sort of a remote issue that could come up, but I think we need to think about whether we want to have them. Um, and, and if we do, then we need to think about how we would follow up on them. I just want to add something about the inspections so that the, the current regulations say that they would be inspected every year. Yeah. And, you know, the inspections are something we would not, you know, I'm sure that our wonderful health inspectors could learn to do this, but it's a huge technical issue. They have lots to do. It's not going to be the health inspectors that would do this. So who is going to do it? Are we going to pay an expert, an outside expert to do it the way that, you know, uh, medical labs have to be inspected? Uh, and so I think that that inspection thing is very questionable as to what it would really happen. If one of us, even I know something about it, but I'm not, that's not the work I did exactly. So I couldn't walk into a lab and know what I was inspecting if they were breaking some rule. So it was a very technical kind of inspection that would be needed if we're serious about it. So I just had a couple of thoughts. And one thing is in one, you have the board will monitor labs. And I thought, well, how and who is gonna monitor it? I think, it would be important for us to know where these labs are and that we have some sense of where they are in case there's a safety issue. But us monitoring them, I agree. I, you know, who would do it? I mean, Ed Smith, do you want to start monitoring research <laughs> labs? Um, and so I so my thought is let's keep it as simple as possible to know where these labs are. And a report if, if, if something happens to them. 
um, and the, and they they make an error, which occasionally happens. The other thing I remember when we were looking at it a while ago or talking about it when it was with Julie or Epi. Um, the, the thing is, if there are any spinoff labs from the university or something that are then in town, but the way they've been going is they've been going to Hadley more than here. <laughs> but if there's a spinoff lab that comes out of the university into the community, uh, just to have some, to know where this stuff is, and if there is a breach of safety that it gets reported to us, but uh, you know, us going in and monitoring, we don't have the staff or the knowledge. You know, if I can make a comment, you know, that sounds, you know, just from my, you know, my ear appropriate, you're not monitoring, not oversight. But I spoke to the uh, fire chief, Tim Nelson, mm -hmm. and I said, what, how are you guys involved? And he said, you know, we, we meet with them, you know, occasionally, but it's good for them to know where these sites are. Right. So I was thinking somehow, you know, with the fire and health department we, together, we could be, you know, a, a partner in understanding their, where they are. But my idea is to just keep it as simple as possible that we know where they are and they might send us a little report, even a, a, a written one that we've had no accidents or leaks and everything is fine this year. Um, and keep it in a notebook. And if there's a fire, you know, then Tim has, you know, but I've never run a lab other than nursing labs and that's, you know, <laughs> simulation and bed baths and things like that. <laughs> Do you have something, Lauren? Yes, I, I probably have more questions than answers. Um, but I I think I mentioned last meeting that where does the liability lie? Like if we have this information and we're being updated on the information, are we like is the is the Board of Health or somehow the town liable if something happens like I, I still don't understand you know where that balance is going to be if we monitor monitor or get information from the the colleges you said Amherst College and Smith College and then there's the I looked at the notes that said um boards of health municipal municipalities do not have the jurisdiction over um, UMass Amherst, but that's a big university here. And I'm just like, well, if we're doing this for, you know, these smaller schools or colleges, like why wouldn't we find a way to monitor what's going on in UMass? So I, to me, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't I know why we're going into this, <laughs> this area, area of monitoring what's happening on a college campus. Um, we might be liable for that. Well, we've had these regulations from two, 2008. Um, so that's part of reviewing them. And as I said, the idea is to know where this is going on in case there's a breach and for the fire department to know if there's a fire and it, it's really and anybody else can chime in. It's to know where they are and to make sure that that they're sticking with the government regulations and to report anything that is untoward if it happens. But does that cap put it in a capsule, Steve? Is that what? All right. By the way, you know, just in terms of reporting, you know, <clears throat> the labs are already under, they are essentially required by the rules they accept to report to the NIH and CDC any certain kinds of spills. Now, the current regulations say that they would have to report any release, any release. Of course, that is not, you can't detect any release. So any release would be one virus particle or something. You can't detect it. So that's kind of not very serious. So, but, the, but we would want to know, of course, and we would put that in, if they are required to report the accident or the released to the NIH or CDC, of course, immediately the health department should be informed of that. That'll be in there. Uh, the I thing think about the, liability is, uh, yeah, I just want to say, Laura, that's a very good question. I don't know anything about that. I really don't know whether we, it makes us liable. 
Um, I don't know. We, I'm sure there, there must be some general rule about that for all the regulations that we put in, uh, but I don't know the answer. Tim, were you going to say something? Yes. Um, especially the research labs are already um, monitored, managed. They also have, need to have an emergency plan for any spill or even any accidents. Um, and also um, some of the uh, management plans and even um, CDC develops a database of all types of research which, which, which involves any type of a biosafety agency. So um, I think if you are drafting something, it should be um, some sort of a guidance in addition to what, what they might be already having from CDC and NIH. Um, what I mean by guidance is, for example, uh, having an emergency plan in place, uh, uh, notifying us as a board of health if there is any any type of an accident or or emergency uh, activity. Um, I mean, those are some things you know, like some sort of transparency might be something we could document in in this one. Just as a, as a team player, as Jen was mentioning, uh, um, that transparency need to be there. What, Steve and I talked about this a couple of times, and one point that Steve made was maybe it, we should address things at level BSL, biosafety lab level three, just in a stronger way, just to have that on record in case there is some sort of um, uh, institute or lab or offshoot of the, you, you know, a, a more commercial type adventure that that is an offshoot of the university or, or a pharmaceutical company here. Um, <clears throat> I, I suppose that could be developed when that was happening, but maybe, um, maybe it, there should be provisions in case that might happen. Um, I was looking through some things in Boston, and it's always interesting to figure out why and what happens when. And they just allowed some changes at the level four. And the reason was so that they could do virus and vaccine um, vaccine research and uh, the, uh, these mRNA vaccines, actually. And this was in 2018, 2019. So the, it, BU developed this uh, national um, emerging infectious disease facility. And so the, the city responded by changing their regulations and uh, allowing that to happen. So I suppose it could go in that direction, but, um, but that was one thought that we had. You know, we don't expect Amherst College or Hampshire College to move to that level, you know, basically because they use students as a lot of their workforce and um, that is, you know, not something that's realistic at that level. Even level three, you realize there's no level three research under our jurisdiction right no, now. You know? No, there's no level three. And we ban we eliminated the idea of level four in the old, old regulations um, and probably wouldn't go back there, but, um, but I, that was another thought. <clears throat> so I think if people would look over that list and just if you have any specific reactions, send Maureen or me an email within the next couple of weeks, it'll be before January 1st, certainly. And then we'll plan to have a draft of the whole thing uh, in time for the next meeting. So uh, Steve, I have a quick question on one of the suggestions you make. Uh, prohibit all work at BSL4, what do you mean by all work? You know, Right now, Mr. most of the work is lab work. Do you think that research in social studies should not be done? No, so in <laughs> other words, there's two kinds of research. There's the, it, for these purposes, there's just the regular research where you take, you know, let's say a germ and try to see how to kill it or something. But there's also recombinant DNA research where you deliberately put a gene into an organism that didn't have that gene before. So that's this recombinant DNA and the previous uh, the existing guidelines say that only re recombinant DNA research at level four is prohibited, 
But I was saying, you know, there's no reason in the world we should have level four research in the town of Amherst. I don't care how many pharmaceutical companies would come in. It's just not suitable for this area or environment. It's, it's just, it's never going to happen anyway. And it's just clearer to say no level four. If level four, if there is a breach, people will get sick and die. And we just, there's no reason Amherst, the yeah. town of Amherst needs to have that. There's my thought. Well, that's like studying Ebola, you know, so it's, it's really high level stuff. Uh, and, um, so and that, I mean, Boston just a lot, just, they just changed their guidance on these areas, in these areas. So we are talking about lab research, not policy research or other type of um, security type of brainstorming. Yeah, the, modeling. It's only research, right, only okay. research that okay. comes under these BSL biosafety level guidelines. So it's entirely biological research and effectively it is research on germs, pathogens. I just, have, I just have to say a funny note. Um, I'm, um, when I made the comment before, I meant, I didn't mean to say Smith, I meant to say Hampshire and Amherst, but when I was coming home, when I was coming home today, there was like this real strong like sewage smell um, in the air, like when I was, you know, I take the bus and I was coming off the bus and it was like really every everywhere, like all the way down the street. And so I was just like, that's really odd because I never smelled that before. But <laughs> I mean, they, things like that could, you know, I don't know where it was coming from, but it just- they were spreading like, manure. If they spread manure, <laughs> oh, they were, that, that, come, yeah. that comes yeah. over. <laughs> The, the honey okay, tree. that was probably it. That, that, that is all kind of tough. Kind of tough. Yeah. One question, Steve and Maureen. So under si section six B would remove all that whole section of about permits. Is that what you were suggesting? Yes, I feel strongly about that. In other words, the current regulations say that the Board of Health will act like a granting agency. We will review the content you know, what, what yes. experiment they're trying to do, what exactly the chemicals are, the whole thing. I and completely we will decide... agree with you. I just wanted to make sure that what, that's what yes. you were saying because I, yeah. read it and I said, oh my God, why is this here? Yeah, yeah. so yes, I, right. I completely agree with that. You can keep the registration, but get away, away from the permitting part of it. Yeah, and inspecting, we can't inspect. We just, we just want to know where they are yeah. and make sure right. they're doing things safely. And if they don't, they report it. Okay, so you'll get back to us, but thank you for all that work. Any other thank comments? You for your thoughts about it. Okay. Yeah, I was playing that game of what was what from the. <laughs> yes. Okay, so the regulations on a refuse. I don't know if we have any guests here today, but um, due to the staff in all departments, are overtaxed by the COVID pandemic and our town's response, I wanna rescind my motion of November 18th. And I look back at everything and I want us to take into consideration that we want to move forward and support the zero waste Amherst pilot project. But looking back again at the board's um, actions in 2009 and 2014 we what we did was related to related to the refuse and um, recycling we responded to town employees coming to us we didn't do anything and um, I, I talked briefly with Jen, and I would really like her to talk with Paul to identify the best steps to take to move forward with this pilot project. Um, maybe Paul should get that Recycling and Refuse Management Committee going again, or a subcommittee of the Sustainable Committee that works with zero waste and figure, figure this out, but no one from the board stepped forward to come and work on it. All other town employees are all too stressed out to work on it. So that motion I made is not tenable. Jen, do you wanna say anything or yeah. anybody want to respond to it? You know, I, I agree with what you said. I think this is, I think we've identified or we know it's really important work 
Um, I know from my point of view, I need to really be focusing on COVID. Just the next few weeks, months, that's where the focus needs to be in this health department. So I think it's really important what we've done and where we are right now. I think you know, for us to move forward, what were the next steps? I don't think we know, but, but what I can do, or, you know, with your help, you guys let me know, is what can I do to move this to a, a good home? So I'll tell you, I did speak to Stephanie um, Cicerella, uh, Cicerello um, from the Conservation Commission, and she just listened to me, I and mean, she's this expert, and she's, she sort of echoed what we said, that there's a need, this is such a valid issue, you know, is there a solid waste master plan? And where can this, this um, important issue live? So I think, you know, listening to her and what you and I, Nancy, have said, I think, you know, I can move, I can speak to um, the town manager and Stephanie again and say, look at there's, I think there's a real need for this. Who can work on it and, and bring it forward? Any other comments? Oops, Ooh, I did something here. <laughs> I lost it. So, um, quick comment. Uh, I know many cities have um, sustainable Northampton, sus you know, sustainable Springfield type of committees, which are having a much more broader goal of re you know moving the city or town towards sustainability in all aspects. Mm -hmm. um, you have a sustainable committee here in Amherst. No, I'm just saying, you know, there might be someone who could take this leadership role, um, especially in this one, because solid waste is a huge aspect, you know, especially yeah. uh, uh, in the future sustainability of the city, town itself. And I think that might be someone they could be involved and be, a, you know, I, I think any master plan related to sustainable development uh, should have this zero waste policy into it. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we still want to support this, mm -hmm. but we need, we need other people to do the work and bring it back to us the way all the other amendments to the, the uh, regulations happened. But we did have a kind of formal vote on this, I think we have to do something other to, than, right. You know, right. So I would like to, I can make a motion to rescind my motion of November 18th and have Jen talk with Paul Bockelman to identify the best steps to take forward to support this pilot project. Um, does, does Why don't we just, it, wouldn't it be just easier to just rescind the motion and then the, uh, I'll do the minutes, they'll say all the stuff that you just said. If you try to put that in the motion, then every okay, word so of it I, comes. I just want to rescind uh, the motion of November 18th due to the everybody being overtaxed by the COVID um, pandemic and our town's response. And, 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 and that it, that's, that's our priority right now. I'll second it. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Um, I would just like to know uh, in the proposal, in the pilot proposal, there's two members of the Department of Public Health. Do we want to uh, talk about that at a further meeting or talk about that now to figure out like would a member of the Department of Health still have to be part of the pilot? Or, or the that's all being so rescinded. Have... Lauren, oh, that's it's all, all being rescinded. rescinded. That's all okay, that okay, okay. being all completely rescinded. And we'll, in okay. January, we'll try and identify next steps with the help of, of Jen, given that we're dealing with COVID. And we still want to support this, but we look at how we're going to support it. Does that answer your question? Okay. No further discussion. I'll call a vote on rescind rescinding the motion of November 18th. Um, Steve? Aye. Tim? Aye. Lauren? Aye. 
Maureen? Aye. Nancy? Aye. So it's been rescinded. Okay, so we'll take that up in January. We do want to move forward with it, but how we do it is still to be determined. Okay, toxic waste, uh, toxic chemical regulation update. Tim and Lauren, you said you were going to get this to us in April. Do you need anything further? Um, just any comments? So we, we started off with the old document and we are looking into, um, we are just starting, you know, we haven't uh, made huge progress on that, but uh, uh, we are thinking about what type of aspects in the schools and what additional changes need to be made, you know, so we should be, ha we should be uh, having something by April. Perfect. Do you need any more support from any of us or Jen? You're just doing fine. Okay, great. Thanks for I mean, the honor. Not, not at this time. <laughs> Okay. Not at this time. We're still in the early stage. Great. Thank you so much for your work. Um, now we're moving on to new business. The well application for 389 Bay Road, a flag lot. Nancy, you know, I apologize. I sent a new agenda. I think it was yesterday. And mm -hmm. is it item, is there item number four on the new agenda? Yeah, but you put it under director's update. So do you want me to just move it up? To I did. I apologize. I'm, I'm looking at it. Hold on. Nope. <laughs> stay on track. Yeah, because I, I thought it was going to be there, but then I saw it was under director's report. So we'll just take it up there. Thank Let's you. Let Ed. Ed finished yes. his business, and um, I think the contractor is also on this call so that we can. Uh... Right. Rich Gale is one of the attendees. Yes. So um, I looked at the map. Ed, you want to make any comments? This seems like a very straightforward application. There's plenty of room, no wetlands nearby, um, no prior history that you know, would be concerning, I think. There is town water down on Bay Road, but it's a long uphill climb, a lot of um, piping, and um, the opportunity in the space is there to do a private well. Um, the plans are moving forward for a single family house on the property, and um, they are willing to connect to town water if necessary, but the preferred option is this well. So I really don't anticipate any issues from this. Um, it should be a straightforward um, installation. Okay. There's, there's an abutting property Does that ha that's already built. Does that have a well or does it connect to town? Um, one, I think at the base of the road is connected to town water. And uh, I think the immediate abutter has its own well. Yeah, it's up, it's way up there too. It is, yeah. And uh, how deep is the well proposed well? Is it going to be shallow or deep? Um, I don't know. I, mean, I don't think we really will, will know until it's built. Um, they often go between two and 400 feet. Um, but I don't, I didn't look into other wells in the area here to see if there was a pattern, um, you know, or something we could to use to answer your question. Yeah, that should be a part of the permit, right? How deep it's going it has to go or it doesn't, it, it hasn't, it been. doesn't it's involve. Part, it's part of the reporting afterwards. Um, we get a detailed drillers report from the well company about what materials they pass through and how much casing they used and um, at what level do they find sufficient water and then the testing that shows that the water um, settles is clear and is in sufficient volume for the purpose they intend in this case to supply one house so the pumping so we'll, rate will be moderate right because it's a one household yes yeah that's part of that that pumping report There'll be a water test submitted to the board, and ultimately you'll grant a, um, if everything passes, you'll grant a water supply certificate, which will show and prove that it's potable water for this purpose.
Any other questions? Okay. Seeing that there are no further Sorry, questions. I always have questions. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> How do you, how do you um, know if the the water is drinkable? Like, do they do if they're using it for drinking? How do you know if the source is drinkable water? Part of the of the Amherst Board of Health's regulations require a pretty extensive water test to be done um, at an environmental lab, and then that those results are submitted to you to the board um, for your review, but. Um, in the, in the north part of Amherst, we have some water um, sort of aesthetic issues, but you no, know, other than that in town, generally we've had a, a really high success rate with water for, this, for drinking purposes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Can I have a motion to accept the well up application for Bay Road? I can do that. Uh, I will make a motion to accept the well application on 389 Bay Road. And a second? I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Maureen? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jo uh, uh, Steve? Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. Okay. That is done. Great. <clears throat> okay. So, anything else you need to say to us, Ed? No, I don't think so. Unless you anticipate that it would be helpful for me to say, I'll exit now if that's okay. I, yes. I think it's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Thanks, for all Ed. your work. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. Happy holidays, whatever one you celebrate or don't celebrate. Uh, as many as possible. And thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The director's update, reviewing food insecurity, the documents from 2013. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So I mentioned this, um, I just, you know, I'm thinking about being the director where we're going and obviously the focus is gonna be on COVID. But Lauren, I brought this up and I wanted to, to look into it because you mentioned it last month about food security. And I thought that was such an important issue. And so I think really what I wanna to say today is that um, it's something that we looked at in the past. In 2010, um, the director um, had a grant, a social justice grant, and we looked at um, a farmer's market and the electronic benefits card. 2014, we partnered with Healthy Hampshire and we did some really good focus groups. Um, we've been looking at them in the department, um, focus uh, surveys in English and Spanish, and really saw there's some significant transportation barriers. Um, 2015, there was a report, 2017, 2018, you know, Survival Center came in. So there was some really solid work. Um, I'd like to you know, my job, I'd like to look at, see what's happened since then. And then maybe Lauren, I can bring you in and we can look at this um, together if you want um, with a new racial equity lens. So I just wanted to offer that, yeah. Also the, the Cress report addresses it and it came up in the listening sessions too. So, and I hope, hopefully it will come up when we do the community assessment. So that's great. So like these things, I don't know. I'd love to get up to speed, but I just wanted to, to offer that to the board. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay, next, flu. So I'm just putting flu in there because I don't want people to forget flu. Um, since September, we've had eight cases. Um, so they came in a little cluster um, about three weeks ago. Um, and you know, it's respiratory season. We're all inside now. Um, masks are half on, half off, all completely off. Um, and, you know, I just, I would say, you know, to the public, you know, if you're getting tested, 
you have these symptoms, it's not COVID, we'll get tested for flu because you know there's antivirals. So anyhow, I just want to let you know that I've started doing um, some flu shots um, at Craig stores. I went to the, um, the ILC and the um, University Motor Lodge and have given some flu shots and I'll be going to restaurants this week. I get it, um, uh, I wanna say free from the state for uninsured or underinsured. And that's all I have to report on flu. And your COVID update. Um, now, I think I may have a different agenda. Do you have tobacco handlers quiz there or no? I printed something else out. I oh, think. you had it in the other. I reprinted this one today. You had it in the other um, agenda. Thanks. I was combining <laughs> yours and mine. So next time. But anyhow, I just want to let you know that I'm still working on the tobacco handlers quiz. Um, and I think that's going to be a January project. I had a, a student working with me and she's unable to, to help me now, but we're going to dig into that. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Thank you. So now talking about um, the COVID update. So I think people know that we've had a really substantial increase in our cases here in Amherst. Um, Steve George provided the board um, with some data, but if you go to the state DPH website, there's that interactive map that's phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of different resources for getting this information. I get our raw data from MAVEN, the Massachusetts Virtual Epidemiological Network. Then I also check the CDC to see we are, where we are with transmission. But I can tell you since yesterday, we have had 62 cases come in. In the last week, 185 cases have come in. Um, these um, cases, if you take a peek, I don't know what percentages, um, uh, UMass uh, student staff and uh, uh, professors, um, but I'd say two thirds are. Um, I can get better numbers um, for, for people and I apologize for that. Um, if you take a peek, you can see that most people are vaccinated. Um, also, just to let people know um, that the age group for um, Massachusetts, the highest case rate um, increases in the age between five and nine. So those are young kids getting sick. Um, Hispanic race ethnicity is the highest. Um, and if you look at clusters, it goes through households and through childcare. And um, I did some uh, contact tracing last weekend, and it was almost to the day after Thanksgiving. It was Thanksgiving's day zero, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, fifth day, people get symptomatic tested on Thursday. Um, so that was a lot transmission after the holidays. Now we might have some cases popping up with people leaving the area and um, getting tested before they travel. Um, so they may not be symptomatic, but those PCRs stay around for a while. In Hampshire County, our percent positivity over the last two weeks is up 1.4%. In Hampton County, south of us, it's 5.7. And north of us, Franklin County is 4.1. So we're up, but uh, less so. So I'd like to think maybe it's our vaccine rate of 93% is calculated at 93% for at least one dose. And uh, maybe our masking policies help towards that. Well, I think so, because you all know I have this little cottage in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. They had to close the library because of mm -hmm. COVID, and they had to close one of the two grocery stores because of COVID last week. Oh, the grocery stores because of the grocery stores work there? Because too many people who worked there got sick. Worked there got sick. Yeah, and they couldn't keep it open. And their positivity rate was 10 point something two weeks ago. I think we're doing a good job here. I think we are too. Um, but I'll tell you, when you make those contact tracing calls, you talk to people. And, you know, I know we all know this, but all those numbers, you know, I've talked to those people that are sick. It's really, you know, it's, it's, it's really tough. It's tough stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, um, 
the mask order is going to stay in place. Mm -hmm. And um, I have asked Paul Bockelman to keep um, the uh, um, the Zoom uh, the meetings um, in place so that um, the AG's um, extension of remote um, con uh, con conference webinars. Um, I'd le like to extend that at least to January and we'll see if it goes further. So January's meeting will be remote. Okay. Um, oh, other COVID topics. Um, we have our community COVID PCR testing with UMass. Thank you so much, UMass. They're great partners. We go grab back, um, our test kits, our PCR, we bring them back. I think we're going through 500, 600 here at the Amherst Banks community and the library per week. Um, so very successful. Get your kit in before 9 a.m. You get your tests uh, 4 p.m., uh, typically 24 to 48 hours. So we're not doing testing now on Friday or the weekend, and UMass is not going to be testing um, through the ha uh, the gen. Uh, uh, December 25th to January 3rd, just to let the community know that. COVID clinics um, continue. Um, thank you again, Steve George, for the calculations that our, um, our vaccine rate for at least one dose is calculated to be 93%. I think we're still at 60% in the schools. I don't wanna say still, because that's a high number for the students, but the, the five through 11. Um, we're doing clinics here at the Bang Center, um, and then um, we'll be doing them to the 23rd, off for one week, and then we'll pick them back up January full force. And thank you Amherst College for letting us use your ultra cold freezer where our Pfizer is stored. And the first week in January, like January 11th, will be the first anniversary of doing vaccine clinics for a whole year. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? Because I think Steve and I volunteered at the first or the second one, and it was January 11th. Wow. wow. One really well. We have great volunteers. Um, we downstairs right now, we have the COVID ambassadors. Um, that are working. So we're happy to have them. And we have some paramedics from the, the Amherst Fire Department. And they're still plugging away. I can see the count as they vaccinate going up. So mm -hmm. like 70 people vaccinated. So that's my COVID update. Is the demand up for the vaccine? Is your sense? Yeah. Um, we are seeing some first dose, second dose, so that vaccine mandate. Um, has uh, you know pushed some folks into um, accepting the vaccine and um, boosters. You know we are only offering Pfizer now. I think we're going to get Moderna afterwards, um, but we're filling up clinics. Mm -hmm. So uh, the sixty-two cases we have right now. Um, you said that they are fully vaccinated. Is it right, Jen? No, you no, know, Tim. I looked. Um, and out of, so the 62 new cases from yesterday, I, and I didn't give you this number, there's a 160 people in isolation now. So when I looked in Maven, um, it said 44 were not vaccinated. I don't know if that means that the data has not been entered, um, but that's what it says. Any other questions for Jen? Okay, so somehow the community health assessment got plunked down here. Somehow, sorry. <laughs> so, so Jen and I um, met on Zoom with faculty, and the main coordinator is Amy Lo Loinas. I don't, I think that's how you pronounce the name. She is the director of internships. So we met with them two and a half weeks ago to talk about, is this possible and what roles would people have? It's the end of the semester, so it's hard for them to work, but I, I got an email back from her. I sent an email 
the end of last week asking for an update if she could before our meeting. And she's been talking with um, Eliza um, Johnson, who's the chair of the Health and Policy and Practice, and Beth Cook, who's the director of the MPH and EPI program. Uh, program. Um, they're very interested, and we're Jen's looking for stipend. And they they did report back to me that two faculty use the University of Kansas toolbox in their program evaluation classes as a reliable standard, and that was part of the tool that I use that when I put the assessment tool together. So that made me feel good yeah. that they are using it, and we were using it. Um, if we have faculty oversight because I asked if we could have faculty oversight. It costs money um, and we can find out exactly how much. To, uh, I don't know if you opened it, um, Jen, but it's like 170. To, I don't know if that's one shot, if that's per hour. I couldn't quite tell from that chart of what it was. And then I thought, well, OK, can they give us a break because town gown um, and treat us as if we're uh, faculty and at the university and not a private corporation asking for help. Um, and then um, I put forward that we could have another Zoom meeting with Amy to talk about it. That, that's, we're moving forward. They want to partner with us, with graduate students. Exactly how it's going uh, is up in the air. I don't know if you have any other questions for us or Jen, do you want to hop in and say anything that you remember from the meeting? No, you know, I just, I'm, I remember sort of thinking how valuable this is going to be if we can use them, incredible, um, you know, I'd rather use them than, you know, a, a firm or somebody that we might hire. Um, and whatever form it takes, I'm really sort of open to it. If it's if it's a class for the one semester, if it's someone's dissertation, um, they're going to be great to work with, and we can figure out what what we need um, as it sort of unfolds. And I'm probably going to audit an epidemiology course because that's one of my weaknesses. And one of the faculty teaches one, and I asked her if I could audit it, and she said yes. So I might be going back to school auditing so that I have better skills in this process. Because what we would do is put a team together um, that the, the board, so I would represent the board and anybody else could represent the board and, and we might have some other community members. It, it's all to be worked out, but we're waiting to find out what level graduate students and other students would be working on this and then move forward to how we can get this started in, um, January or February. So for grad students, if you can find some sort of a practicum or independent study prop possibilities. Um, so we need some sort of a willing faculty to just to supervise them, you know, and that will be the much cheapest option for us. Uh, and then the students get credit for it. So it's not, you know, so I think that, you know, if that is possible, the only thing is we need a willing faculty to just to supervise that, you know, the practicum of Yes, we have willing it. faculty, but we have to pay them. That's what they're saying. I don't get paid for doing it. I know. Practice. I don't know why they, <laughs> someone should be paid for that. <laughs> because it's a, it's a part of the uh, coursework, right? Because they yeah. are all listed coursework in public health and other areas like independent study and practicums. And well, they I, get, I'm, I know from nursing, and I'm thinking the public health might be using this uh, a, a business model, where um, where in nursing they kind of like drop students off and have employees of the agency or the hospital or whatever do all the teaching and whatnot, and then the faculty member sort of drifts in and drifts out. So I, I'm not sure. <clears throat> And we can meet and find out, but I, I got the sense that we have to maybe pay this drifting faculty person from that last email, but we can get um, clarification in another meeting. I think Jen, maybe you and I should just meet and then get back to, I, I just got this email from um, Amy and I, and, and so. Okay. Yeah, I did mention it. Um 
to to some folks here about um, getting maybe ARPA funds for payment, and they were open to that, but it just needs to be discussed further. We can maybe meet the beginning of next week and then get in touch with uh, Amy. Okay. So that's all I have to update on that. Then topics not anticipated by the chair. I have a couple of topics to bring up. Um, one is um, I emailed Liz, one, I kind of looked over our minutes of the past year and um, I sent an email to Liz Why Not to get an update on the tapestry van. And um, she said that she's beginning to go, with the van's beginning to go regularly, regularly to Amherst. Mm -hmm. And they almost have their full complement of necessary staff. And once they have all the staff, they'll be coming to Amherst every week. And then and she's trying to schedule meetings in um, mid-December uh, with key stakeholders, um, such as Craig's Doors. She's been in contact with Survival Center, Elliott Homeless Services, um, to introduce people to the service and work with them on how the tapestry van can go to those sites to provide services. And... Um, so that's where the, the van is at. I don't know if you know anything else, Jen. To add. No. Yeah. Oh, um, I think this sort of ties into me thinking about the Amherst Human Service Network and kind of kickstarting that again. I thought that was such a valuable um, network of, of people. Um, I know how important they were during COVID getting supplies to people. So I'm trying to decide, figure out what's out there and you know I don't think this is a duplicate of services but you know what services do they offer is there anyone else doing it I'd love to just find out more um, about everything in Amherst so I'd, I'd like to speak to them they used to be here right in Amherst wasn't there a tapestry no it's always been in Northampton I thought there was oh, one there was Amherst. one on Prey Street there was an office oh, oh I didn't know that like 20 yeah. years ago or 17 or something. Maybe not even that long ago. Oh, I, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Everything's mixed I mean, up. yeah. I, I mean, I'm used to trying to refer students to tapestry for various services. And, uh, I, and you know, there are little bits of time in different places around, around the valley at one point in time. But they're great. I want to support them. And I'd love to meet with Liz. Why not? And the other thing I wanted to bring up is now that the town council is changing, I don't know, Jen, if you ask Paul or if we write a letter or contact Lynn for our new liaison, because George Ryan had been our liaison and I'm unaware of his during COVID connecting with any of our meetings. And I think it's important to have a liaison who will go back and tell the town council what we're doing. In the past, when Diane Stein was the liaison as a select person, she came to probably three quarters to maybe 90% of the meeting, meetings. And also with um, Connie, I can't remember her last name. She came to most of our meetings. Um, I know it's on Zoom and I remember last winter George came to a couple, but I'm unaware of him uh, seeing him as a participant. Maybe he listens to the recording. Uh, somehow I don't think so, but really uh, so that the town council knows what the Board of Health and the health department are doing. I, th I think it's important to have a more proactive liaison to get our what's happening with us to the town town council. I don't know what other people think about that. Hey, you know, George is my neighbor, so we I've talked to him a few times, but you know, he you're right, he has not been coming to the meetings very much, I don't think. So yeah, I think after January 1, just contact Lynn, assuming she'll be the chair of the council and remind them. Didn't know that was a, a role. I can do that. Yeah. Okay. You can say that the board has reached out to you as our agent to yes. make sure we have a more.
proactive uh, liaison. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't oh, just a new, I mean, a new, li new liaison a because new George liaison. is not going to serve. George is not on there. Right, yes. Okay. And then, oh, I should have brought this up when Ed was there. I read in the newspaper that there was a house condemned on Allen Street. Do you know? <laughs> it was a fraternity party. Um, do you know anything about it? And I, I missed my golden opportunity when Ed was here to ask him about it. I saw it in the newspaper today. <laughs> Uh, it was sort of an offshoot fraternity party. That, I and mean, that's all I have for topic. It's not anticipated. And public comment. I don't know if there are any participants who... There are, but no hands are raised. No hands are raised. Okay, there we go. Um, our next Board of Health meeting is the 2nd of uh, the second Thursday of the month, which is January 13th. And that we always meet on the second Thursday, unless it's a national holiday. And anything else before we adjourn? I want to make a quick question. This is not a topic not anticipated. I know the winter cold weather coming up. I'm just curious how our resources for handling homeless and other shelters um, needs. And I'm just wondering if, if we usually keep in touch with that. Um, so are you referring to, you know, I'm, I'm speaking with Bob Horowitz, who's the physician with Craig Stores. He and I communicate maybe twice a week. So I'm going back um, for uh, COVID and flu shots next Thursday. Um, so, you know, I'm aware of what's going on there, the number of folks there and at the UML. There was something, and I'm sorry I didn't bring this, I don't know, but um, they're looking to have a warming center at the um, VFW. I think they're still looking at if it's uh, 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 occupants, I'm sorry, um, standards. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. No, I'm, I'm just asking for yeah. general needs mm -hmm. that we could help help them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of there is a critical resource need or space mm -hmm. needs or even mm -hmm. uh, any type of a specific uh, things we could do to help them out, you know, especially during this time. You know, so. mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You know, I could I could certainly, you know, put some feelers out. You know, we could speak to Amherst Survival Center. They're so supportive of our whole community. I could also call either Kevin Noonan um, or Jerry Weiss. I know I've been going through clothes and washing um, coats and getting boots and cleaning them all up and mm -hmm. bringing them to the resource trailer and women's clothes um, to the, the university lodge. And I, I put them in bags with what it is and the size of it. And they've been very receptive to mm -hmm. that. Um, last year, I, I bought gift cards for everybody there. Mm -hmm. but This year, I'm not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I can, I can also contact them and ask them if there's anything that we as a board can do. I know at the beginning of the week I was in Holyoke and there was this person with a sign and I, I handed him a dollar. And then I said, do you know about, I said, do you have a place that's warm to stay? And he said, well, I have a tent. And I said, do you know about Craig's doors? And he said, no. So I drove around, wrote all the information on a piece of paper in the, in my car and I handed it to him and my husband said I was a sucker. I gave him five dollars to take a bus to Amherst to get to Craig's stores. But I saw him, he was reading all of it and he said, thank you. He didn't know about Craig's stores. So uh, and I walk around town with hand warmers and toe warmers and and hand them out and ask people. Oh there. That's so a when great it's really idea. close, cold, and I ask them, and, and sometimes I have granola bars and ask them if they have a warm place to stay. Mm -hmm. And then my husband says, well, what are you going to do if they say no? I'll say, well, go to Craig's doors. And he's, well, what if they say I won't go there? And I said, I don't know. I'm just doing the best I can. So, but that's a good idea, Tim. Um, and I'll contact Kevin and, and Jerry Weiss. 
I, I know where we're at now, but if I could just add on us, um, again, trying to gather information, just like um, all of us, um, you, Jennifer, um, as well. Uh, is there, is there, as the Board of Health, is there, like, as we do the uh, public health assessment, is there, like, a particular clinic that we work with or... Um, I, I know personally, I go, um, to the Masante clinic that's in mm -hmm. the, the senior center in the Bangs, um, center and mm -hmm. like to just kind of get, a a a more like just understanding, I guess, of what the town is going, what's going on in the town health wise, like is there, like if we're concerned about the homeless or concerned about people getting access to um, healthcare, is there like a, 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 like a, a way that we can connect with like these health clinics that can give us some understanding of, you know, it has COVID impacted people going to seek care or, you know, because I think for me, that's really where you know, things are important for me is that, you know, we have social circumstances like um, food access or homelessness, but that can impact someone's health. But, but do we know like how to make that connection to like providing actual healthcare services to, you know, mm -hmm. individuals that might have these difficult you know, life circumstances. And, and I know we're putting the zero waste thing on hold, but if, if, is there a way, like when we have the, the pilot program, is there a way to like work with one area of Amherst, like maybe North Amherst or South Amherst? Like I, I know I, I seem to like kind of go off on a tangent, but I just, I feel like I haven't seen the, the data. And I know that the health assessment is like something that's in the works but I I just don't know where are these where are these places that we can actually get like the actual like information to know that people are accessing health care or ac or not accessing I don't know if that made sense but Lauren your heart is in the best place ever um Part of this, we'll get the data from the community assessment. Also, Jeff Harness from Cooley Dickinson Hospital, because of the Affordable Care Act, Cooley Dickinson has to do every five years a big community health assessment. But it, it's very broad, and it just tells us a lot of what we already know. It doesn't go down. And with the health assessment that we're doing, we'd be doing it by census tracts in small geographic areas. So like we would look at South Point, but we would also look at the census tract that South Point is in. And I think there's, I can't remember off the top of my head, there's seven, seven census tracts in Amherst. So we would be doing small group analysis in the town and then bringing that all together. But as you said, Musanti is, is is a, is a big issue. And there was a problem. I th think they don't have the person who helps with insurance. I, uh, it came out at the listening session. There were big gaps during the pandemic. And I don't know if they've pulled anything more together. Um, yeah. it, it's a tremendous resource, mm -hmm. um, but COVID really made everything very difficult. for providers. Anybody else? Yes. Do you have any more comments for? Quick, um... quick question. Uh, I know that there is a um, infrastructure bill, which, which usually is going to pump a huge amount of money into the state. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you are prepared for some sort of a proposal or anything, keep, keep it ready because I think they might be looking for shovel ready projects, you know. There's going to be a huge amount of money coming in. And I'm just curious, you know, because we had a proposal last year or the year before. Uh, 
So it will be good to actually keep something ready. This is for Jen's idea. You know. Okay. <laughs> love to have a big infusion of money. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Any more comments before we have a motion to close? And I want to wish everybody a, a thank you for all the work you've done during this past year. It was very difficult. And whatever holiday you may celebrate, may you have a wonderful holiday. So we have a motion to close the meeting. Move that. Okay, Steve has a motion to close. I I'll... second it. Thank you, Tim. Tim? Uh, aye. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? Aye. Steve? Aye. Nancy, aye. And thank you, Jen, for all, all your right. work. Yeah, thank you. Get in contact for meeting next week about the assessment. Okay. So thank, thank you, you all. all. And thank you all so much for all the work you've done this past year. It's been a, a real difficult year. And, and I really thank everybody for all they've done. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Happy holidays. Yeah. Yes. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye, Bye bye. All right. I'm going to stop recording.